morning, if you've got your Bibles, we uh, are going to be in James chapter 1. If you're maybe not that familiar with your Bible, James is pretty close to the end. It's right close there. Um, feel free to use your table of contents. Never any shame in that. Ask the person next to you. Maybe they can help you. But James chapter 1, and we are going to be looking at the last portion of the chapter, verses 19 through 27. 19 through 27. We've been doing a series in the book of James, and James is kind of an interesting book because a lot of times with the biblical authors, we'll have, especially in the New Testament, we'll have multiple letters from them, multiple things that they wrote. Paul writes a lot. Peter's got a few letters. Even John has a couple of different things. And we, we get kind of a large sample size to get a sense of who they are and how they communicate and how they speak. But for James, this is the only letter we get from him. And so it's kind of interesting because we've got a really short, like, literary sample size to get a feel for who he is. And James sometimes gets a bit of a, a bad reputation. I don't know what kind of a, a person he was. We don't get to see him. We don't think we get to see this James in the Gospels necessarily. And so I don't know, like, what kind of character qualities he had or characteristics. But in his writing, he sort of famously comes off as, like, uh, pretty hard-nosed and pretty in-your-face and kind of almost aggressive with how he writes. And I don't think he's unkind, but he's definitely the kind of person who seems to see the world in shades of black and white, like there's not a lot of gray. And if you guys know anybody like that, some of you are like, yes, I'm sitting next to that person, I married them, or whatever. <laughs> he seems to see the world in, in shades of like, in, in terms of black and white, and he seems to communicate that way as well, like pretty straightforward, pretty abrupt. And we're going to see some of that in, in the section of scripture that we're going to be looking at this morning. But I think that he's also like, that for him comes out of a very deep heart of pastoral care. Like there is a, a passionate desperation on his part to care for the people that he's writing to because he sees some things that need to be addressed and need to be adjusted. And he wants to see the churches that he is overseeing, he wants to see them experience the greatest health possible. And I think that's where that, that passion and that kind of bluntness comes out of. So uh, let's go ahead and read James chapter 1, verses 19 through 27, and then we'll take some time to, to look more closely at it. It says this, My dear brothers, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. For man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent, and humbly accept the word planted in you which can save you. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in a mirror and, after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this, not forgetting what he has heard, but doing it, he will be blessed in what he does. If anyone considers himself religious and yet does not keep a tight rein on his tongue, he deceives himself, and his religion is worthless. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress, and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Let's go ahead and pray this morning as we, uh, as we gather together to listen to God. Father, I pray that you would speak today, that you would use James's words here, and that you would speak through what I have to share Lord, that you would work in us today. Guide us by your Holy Spirit. Help us to see where you are growing things in our lives, God, working in the soil of our souls. Father, and bring us into the process. Bring us alongside and help us to, to, to work with you, to participate and partner with you. God, we want to be listening to you and what you have to say to us, and we want to be growing in your direction, so to speak, God, growing in the way that you have designed us to grow. So be here today. Speak to us. Help us to understand what you're saying. Help us to hear you clearly. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So as we get into this this morning, I'm going to take this in sort of three parts. And the, there's a sheet of notes in your bulletin. If you're interested, go ahead and get it out and you can kind of follow along. But I'm going to take this in three sections. And the first thing that James talks about and the third thing that James talks about are actually quite similar. He's going to say some things about our speech and the way that we talk. He's going to say some things about, um, you know, moral evil and being corrupted and things like that. But then the central part that he talks about, he uses this metaphor, this analogy of a mirror. And the whole conversation that he has, and really so much of what he's going to talk about over the course of this letter, 
is the idea of letting our faith, our trust in God, our hope in him, translate into action. You know, what we believe about God and, and, and our spiritual lives changing how we live and how we make decisions and how we conduct ourselves. That forms sort of the central idea behind what James is so concerned about. And we're going to get some glimpses into that as we go on through the rest of the book of James. But he, he wants to see churches and people and Christians that are genuinely being transformed by the work that God is doing in their hearts so that they are living well. And so that the kingdom of God, as Jesus prayed in the gospel of Matthew, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven so that that process is happening and the world is looking more and more like heaven because of the way that these Christian believers are living in the world around them. And the title of the message this morning kind of comes out of that. The title is Not Just a Listener, which I've taken out of verse 22 this morning where uh, he says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves, do what it says. But I want to make something clear about what James is going to say this morning and really for the rest of his letter through the course of this. Um, we, there's a temptation and a tendency to come to portions of scripture like this, really the Bible as a whole, but especially the way that James phrases himself. And I kind of walk away with the sense of being really overwhelmed and overburdened because you walk away with this really long list of, oh my goodness, there's like three dozen things that I have to fix about myself. Okay? And that's not James's heart for us, I don't think. I do think that he wants us to see ourselves clearly, but I don't think he wants us walking away and giving up because we're so overwhelmed with all the things we see in our lives that need to be fixed. I think James knows that the goal for our lives is to see things that God wants to address and then to take them to God himself and to invite God into those spaces and say, God, I see this about myself and I'm not sure that it's supposed to be there. I would like to be different in this way. Can you work in me? Can you speak to me? And I think James knows that, and he won't explicitly say it all the time because I think he assumes that his original audience knew it as well, okay? But for you and I, sometimes it can be easy to feel like James is getting up on the pulpit and pointing his finger and yelling at us, and I don't know that that's his heart. I think he wants to be encouraging us to take the things in us to God and to submit ourselves to God and say, Father, I need you to lead me in this. I want to grow because of how you're growing me and not walking away with a list of, oh my gosh, I've got to fix all these things in myself today. All right? Can we kind of hang on to that together as we continue this morning? Okay, good news. Okay, here we go. So James gets in with the first few verses and he begins with this commentary about our speech, how we talk. So let's reread verses 19 and 20. My dear brothers, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. For man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. This is going to end up becoming a common theme with James. He is very concerned with how we use our speech, our voices, the words that we say. And he repeats here an idea that is not new in Scripture. These things have been said many, many times. Back in Proverbs chapter 17, verses 27 and 28. The one who has knowledge uses words with restraint, slow to speak. And whoever has understanding is even-tempered, slow to become angry. Even fools are thought wise if they keep silent and discerning if they hold their tongues. So even if I am a fool, I can trick people into thinking that I'm quite a bit better if I can just shut up and not say anything, okay? There's a lot of power in being restrained in what we say and not speaking, not speaking out. There's an old saying that God gave us two ears and one mouth, so we should listen twice as much as we speak. And that's just generally good advice, but I think James has something more than just good advice in mind here as he shares this with us because he mentions specifically anger as a problem with speaking too much and too quickly. And again, this is not a new thought. Letting anger push us into saying something that we'll regret later is pretty common to the human experience in general, isn't it? That's something that we've all dealt with at one time or another, either in ourselves or, you know, I mean, honestly, Thanksgiving is coming up soon. We will have an opportunity to exercise our anger and our quick speech if we really want to, right? I don't know. That, thankfully, that's never been the story of my family. That's like the stereotype in general, okay? And so I joke about it. But honestly, if like Thanksgiving is a painful time for you, I'm sorry. And that was not my, I wasn't trying to dig at you and make it worse. So, Okay. He says, human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. James isn't saying that anger is always bad and that we should never be angry. He's saying that there are two different kinds of anger. 
There's the purely human anger that is separated from the will of God that isn't being led by him. And then there is a kind of anger that comes from the heart of God that is led by the Holy Spirit that does produce righteousness. And he's trying to help us see the difference and the distinction between those two things. And honestly, we see this borne out in scripture, don't we? Even in the life of Jesus, do we see Jesus get angry sometimes? You bet we do. It absolutely happens. It doesn't happen often, all the time, but it happens with intentionality and with power a couple of times. There's a story when he goes into the temple, the the religious home of the nation of Israel, and he gets mad at the money changers there, the economic people who were taking advantage of the people of Israel, who were financially robbing from them as they came to worship. And Jesus flips their tables over and drives the animals out, and he says, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have turned it into a den of robbers. And he demonstrates some pretty profound anger in that moment. There are other stories where he's talking to the religious leaders of the nation of Israel, to the Pharisees. And we can tell by the words that he uses and the kind of tone that he shares himself that he's pretty frustrated with them for being poor leaders. Not all the time, but there are moments where you can see the anger coming through. And there are plenty of other stories in scripture as well where biblical characters in connection with God being led by the Holy Spirit demonstrate some kind of an anger and the fruit of it, the produce of it is righteousness and health that comes out. But not always. There are moments where we see characters get it wrong too. That that human anger wins out and they sort of stay disconnected from God and they miss his leading. There's a story from the life of Moses. You may be familiar with him. Moses was the guy who led the the children of Israel out of bondage in Egypt. If you've seen the Ten Commandments or the Prince of Egypt animated movie, he's the main character. He was the guy with the story of the burning bush. And many years later, as the Israelites are wandering through the desert, he has a moment where his anger gets the better of him. And the Israelite people are out of water and they're whining and complaining. And God says, there's this big rock. I want you to take your staff and go to the rock and speak to the rock and tell it to open. And I'm going to make water come out so that everybody can drink water. A pretty like significant miracle. But Moses in that moment, we see this, this, this human anger kind of overcome him. And he takes the staff like God told him to. But then instead of speaking to the rock, he takes his staff and he beats the rock until it splits open and water comes out. And the miracle still happens, but God comes to him afterward and he says, this is a problem. You've made a mistake. There was something happened in this. And that becomes a moment for Moses that sort of haunts him for the rest of his life. That in that moment where his very human anger came in and he allowed himself to stay separated from God's leading in that space. And you and I can sometimes find ourselves in the same position. So what's the difference? What's the difference between the two? This may come as a surprise to some of you, but being a Christian doesn't automatically mean that your anger is always righteous anger. I don't know about you, sometimes I fall into that space, right? I'm a Christian, and I'm angry right now, therefore, this is Christian anger, and it must be righteous, right? That's not how it works, okay? For better or for worse, that's not how it works. One of the consequences of sin is that we have been disconnected from God in all the areas of our lives, and we're now reaping the consequences of that. We're dealing with the fallout of it. But that also means that in my native, my natural self, my emotions are disconnected from God as well. And sometimes my emotions can be, they're they're God-given things. My emotions are a gift from God. Even my anger is a gift from God. It's a reflection of his character in me, in us. But when I disconnect those things from him, when they are not submitted to his will, when I am not being led by the Holy Spirit, they can be very disruptive and very, very destructive sometimes in the world around me. And anger can become part of that. It's something that we've got to watch over and we've got to be careful with. If I'm not allowing God to speak to my heart, to lead my passions and my emotions, they can get pretty out of balance and can lead me into some serious problems. And this is the distinction that James is talking about here. He's not telling us that we can never be angry. He's telling us that human anger, disconnected from God, unsubmitted to the will of the Lord, is a destructive force that will not result in righteousness the way that God wants it to. In chapter 3, he's going to come back to this idea. He's going to compare our speech to a forest fire, in fact. Jesus didn't just get angry when he saw something wrong with the world around him. He got angry when the Holy Spirit led him to become angry. And that's something that we need to learn as well. So James continues his thought, and he says, Get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent. 
The Greek word that gets translated get rid of means to take off or to lay aside. It's this thing that can be removed and set down. It's very similar to what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 22 through 24. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. It's this imagery of like clothing, of saying put off the corrupted self. Like if your clothing is torn or stained or dirty, take it off and put on the new thing that God has made available. Some of you may remember our lead pastor, Brandon, a couple of years ago on Easter, he he did this great sermon illustration where he brought a whole rack of clothes up here on stage and he put on like a dozen or so shirts all on top of each other and then walked around afterward. Real memorable. Clearly it stuck with me, okay? But he was talking about this same exact thing, this image, this picture of putting on the good things that God has made available for us and taking off the things that don't belong. James is continuing something very much so, but he finishes his thought with sort of an agricultural metaphor instead of a clothing one. He says, humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. He doesn't tell us to put it on. He just tells us to accept what God has already placed there inside of us. The seed is there, but it needs tending. If you've got your notes this morning, the first fill in in, uh, fill in, in the notes this morning is this. What has God planted in you? What has God planted in you, in the soil of your soul, in the garden of your life? What is God trying to grow? God has an agenda for you, for your growth, for your development. He has things that he wants to cultivate. Do you know what those things are? Are you listening for his voice? Are you paying attention to the work that he's doing in the garden of your soul? Maybe you're here this morning and you've been a Christian for a very long time and God has done lots of work in you and your garden has grown very fruitful. That's wonderful, but I have news for you. You're not done. None of us is done. God is not going to stand back and say, oh, this one's good enough. I'm finished. No more growing. That's not how it works, okay? There is always something new that he wants to do. I myself am not a gardener at all. In fact, there's very few things in life. I like looking at other people's gardens. I like appreciating the work that other people have done to grow gardens. I think that's wonderful. I, but I myself am not interested in gardening or growing at all. It looks hard, okay? And I'm just not interested in that, okay? But most of the gardeners that I know, they don't stop, do they? Like there doesn't come to a point where you're working on your garden and you're like, ah, it's good enough. That's fine. I'm done now, Right? There's a, there's a continued investment. There's always new plans. There's always new ideas. Oh, I want to try these kind of raised beds. I want to switch out for this sort of crop this year or whatever it is. And it's this ongoing process. The same thing is true for God working in our lives. He's never done, okay? But maybe you're here this morning and you are, are very new to trying to follow Jesus or you, you're not even following Jesus. God is still working in your heart too. And maybe, maybe what he is growing there is still very small or just in the earliest stages, but God is still doing something in us. And the question for us is always going to be, are you paying attention to what he's doing? Are you aware of the work that he's engaged in? Are you watching what's growing? And are you trying to agree with what he's doing? Are you coming alongside? How responsive are you to the work of God in your life? So then James transitions to kind of the the middle portion, and this is where he'll draw in the metaphor of that mirror and start talking about what it means. So let's read verses 22 through 25 together. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in a mirror and, after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this, not forgetting what he has heard, but doing it, he will be blessed in what he does. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Here's that central idea of his that he's going to return to over and over again. Let your faith translate into action. What we do should come out of who God has grown us to be. And he compares hearing the word and not doing what it says to looking at your own face in the mirror and then walking away and forgetting what you look like. And I remember reading this for years and years and years and finding this to be kind of a silly metaphor. Like, who forgets what they look like? You know, like, who walks away and then just doesn't, like, if you see a picture of yourself, you're like, who's that? I don't... 
And part of that is because we, we grew up in a world, right, where there are basically mirrors in every single bathroom you could ever realistically go into. And even like half the bedrooms we could go into have mirrors in them. We see images of ourselves everywhere in security monitors at the store. Or some of you have already taken like half a dozen selfies this morning, okay? It's just part of like your daily morning. Not for me, but for some of us it's part of... The, it's easy to see images of ourselves, pictures of ourselves. For those folks back at the time, for James's listeners, it was not quite so easy. They had mirrors, they existed, but their mirrors were really different. They didn't start using glass to make mirrors until quite some time after James would have written this. For them, most mirrors would have been like a polished metal, probably bronze. And it would not have been a, a perfect mirror. You would have had to put some effort into kind of changing the angle and looking at it to really see yourself clearly and to understand who you were. And for them at the time, it was probably a fairly normal occurrence to not have a great sense of what you looked like in yourself because seeing your own reflection was just less common for them than it is for us. And I think James is grabbing onto that and he's pulling it into the picture that he's talking about here. A person who only listens to the word and doesn't do what it says is like a person who has no real solid idea what they look like because they haven't taken the time to stare into the mirror. The second thing that strikes me about the mirror metaphor is something that I think is much more common to us. When we use mirrors, we aren't usually trying to get a sense of what we look like. That's pretty well settled for most of us. When we use mirrors, what are we usually trying to do? We're trying to fix something, right? We, we're looking for things that need to be corrected. I knew I was going to preach about this this morning, and so I went to the mirror like a dozen times today, checking for like, I got to make sure that there's no stains or whatever, or nothing going on, because I don't want somebody coming up afterward and being like, hey, you've got this giant rip in your pants or whatever. That, okay? When we go to a mirror, we're trying to look for the, how is my hair today? Do I have, is there dirt on my face? Is there a tear in my shirt? What, what needs fixing? What needs adjusting? And this is a very common thing for us, even to the point of like, how many of you guys have ever been driving and seen somebody else in the car trying to fix something in the rear view mirror while they're driving, okay? Can you please get to a light first, all right? Now, please know I, that's a very hypocritical thing of me to say because I have absolutely been the guy picking my nose in the rearview mirror a couple of times in my life, okay? There, as one of your pastors, that's me being real honest this morning, okay? That's a thing that has happened. And I think James has this in mind as well when he tells us this. The person who hears the word but doesn't do it is like a person who looks in the mirror and sees that they have a booger hanging out of their nose and then walks away and forgets that there is something hanging out of their nose. And James is writing this letter to his church. Is like, people, fix your boogers, okay? <laughs> Pay attention. Remember what you've seen of yourself that needs addressing. If I see dirt across half my face in the mirror and then don't wash it off afterward, okay, something's wrong with that picture. When I see things that are going on, they need to be addressed. I need to take those things and bring them to God and say, God, get involved here. Work on this with me. I realized as I was getting ready for this between the two services, I was like, I did miss a golden sermon illustration this morning by not having like a smear of dirt on my face or something fake and gross hanging out of my nose that it could have been part of the message this morning. You're welcome for not doing that, I suppose, but could have been, missed it. Oh, well. And I think that both ways of looking at this metaphor are important for us because ultimately the purpose of a mirror is to help us see ourselves more clearly. And this is the next spot in our notes this morning, the fill-ins. And there's three things kind of all together that I'll say at the same time. God wants us to see ourselves clearly. He does. God wants us to see ourselves clearly and for two reasons. One, to see our identity he wants us to clearly see who we are, but also he wants us to know our own need for growth. He wants us to know who he designed us to be, but he also wants us to see the things in us that need to be addressed, that need to be fixed, that need to be changed. He wants us to see both. We might live in a world chock full of mirrors, but we also live in a world filled with people who don't know who they are. They don't know that they're made in the image and the likeness of God, the creator of reality. We each have immeasurable value because the fingerprints of God are all over us. 
We are made in his image and in his likeness, male and female, he has created us. We all reflect something of the creator because of how he has designed us. And many of us don't know it. We spend our time trying to build an identity for ourselves, trying to make something of ourselves, trying to chase after all of these things that could be without realizing what God has spoken. I catch this in myself all the time. I realize that I have this internalized set of expectations and hopes and priorities for me and my growth and who I'm supposed to become. And I'll catch myself in moments when I'll realize, oh my goodness, I have not let God speak into this space in a very long time. That the vision of myself that I'm trying to become is something that has not been influenced by God the way that it should have been for me. Uh, If you guys have ever had the opportunity to walk past like a funhouse mirror or something like that, a mirror that is intentionally warped or bent so that it will give you an improper and usually humorous reflection. But the truth is we live in a world filled with funhouse mirrors around us all the time trying to show us a version of ourselves that is not clear, that is not accurate, that is warped in one way or another. And if I try to base my sense of self, my sense of identity on the warped mirrors around me, I am going to end up pretty messed up and pretty out of whack. I have got to be engaging in my life of prayer and my time of reading the word in going to God and saying, God, help me to understand who you've designed me to be, who I am because of what you say about me. Some of you may have seen the the, uh, Disney animated movie, The Lion King, before, but there's a great scene toward the end of the movie where the main character, Simba, has been lost in the jungle with his friends for quite a few years, and he bumps into the baboon, Rafiki, and Rafiki is trying to help reconnect him to his past. And Rafiki takes him through the jungle down to a pool of water, and he shows him his own reflection, and he says to him, you think your dad is gone, but when you look at your reflection, you can see your father in you. In church, the same thing is true for us, that we should be able to see our Father in our own reflections. He is there. God's image is in us. And then, of course, Simba goes away, and he has that great moment, right, where his dad, Mufasa, comes to him in the clouds and speaks to him. And James Earl Jones does the voice in that way that I cannot imitate and says, remember who you are. And it's this turning point in the movie. And, folks, we need to remember who we are as well. We need to go to God and we need to hear from him and we need to let him hold up a mirror to us, one that is clear and accurate, one that does not show the warps around us that the world has so that we can know who he has designed us to be. But we also need to see our own need for growth. I need to know when I've got a smudge of dirt on my face or when there's a metaphorical booger hanging out of my nose and grossing people out. I need to know when my clothes are ripped and torn and dirty. I need to know when something has gone wrong with the image before me so that I can address it, so that I can do something about it, so that I can bring it to God and say, God, I am clearly struggling with this issue of fill in the blank, whatever's going on for you, okay? James has already identified anger at the beginning of this section where we can come to God and say, God, I am dealing with anger. I already yelled at my family and shouted at my kids this morning or whatever it was. I need you to be speaking into this area in my life because I'm seeing my reflection and I don't love it. I don't love what I see going on right here, but I can't fix this in myself because the truth is I can't. I'm not the one who fixes myself, am I? I've tried fixing myself before. It doesn't work all that well. In the end of the story, God is the one who fixes me. God is the one who comes and through his transformative power makes me look more like his son, Jesus. He is the one that I am submitted to. And that's not a contradiction between these two things, by the way. We can be made in the image of God with infinite immeasurable value and also need to grow as well. Sometimes we can get those two ideas conflated and mixed up with each other. And I can end up in this place where I think, if I'm not growing, if I'm not developing, if I'm not doing well in Christian maturity, then God might love me less. And the truth is that God's love for me, his opinion of me is fixed. It's not going anywhere. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Amen? Amen. When Jesus went to the cross, the work that he did on the cross said permanently forever, they are worth it to me. They are mine. I want them in my family and their value to me, their worth to me is not going anywhere. And it's from that place that we start to grow and we start to develop. I love the story from Luke chapter 15 of the prodigal son. 
The young man who leaves home, who makes a whole bunch of bad decisions, who wrecks his life, and then finally comes back to the father in the end. And the father, does he love his son less afterward because of the bad decisions? No, he does not. He comes running out of his house and he hugs the son and he cries with him and he puts new clothes on him and and, and he brings him back into the family and he throws a party. Are they probably going to have some conversations about how the son can like make some changes and do things a little bit? Of course he is because he loves his son because he wants to see him grow, but it doesn't change the value that he has for his son. And the same thing is true for you and I. Your value, God's love for you is fixed. It is not going anywhere. And it is out of that place, in addition from that ground, that God wants to help us grow, that he wants to help us develop, that he wants to help us change, that he wants us to become more like his son, Jesus. My need for growth does not stop God from valuing and loving me. And so James transitions into the final section of what he has to say this morning, and he returns to this idea of what we say and how we speak. Verse 26, if anyone considers himself religious and yet does not keep a tight rein on his tongue, he deceives himself and his religion is worthless. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. I am deceiving myself and my religion is worthless if I do not keep a tight rein on my tongue. That's a bit of a hard message to hear, isn't it? Okay, that it's tough for me even to like read that one and like, part of me cringes a little bit and, and I sit down and think, man, is my, I hope my religion's not worthless. Like, what, is, what does this look like? I want to be healthy. And it's a reiteration of what he said earlier and he's going to come back to this image again. But reins are something that we use with horses or with other uh, pack animals, riding animals to help guide them and, and control them. They're a useful tool to help the animal do something constructive. And horses have to learn how to respond well to the reins. I had the opportunity, I used to, to ride ponies and horses when I was little. My great aunt had some property outside of Corvallis and owned some horses and got to go there once a year, once uh, every so often, ride them and I love doing it, but I was not like, I was not a 4-H kid growing up. It was not like what I did on a regular basis. I only had sort of a cursory example. But I, I, enough to sort of see, I still remember one time, one of the horses got out of the pen and got angry because there was a dog that got loose in the pasture and the dog was acting kind of aggressively and the horse got defensive. And I remember watching this horse defend itself and I thought, that thing is strong, Like, if that thing really wanted to hurt me, it would have absolutely no problem injuring me in some pretty significant ways. And James is going to revisit this idea, and he's going to compare our speech, our tongues, the way that we use our voices to these powerful images. And he's going to say, we have to be careful. But I like that he brings in this idea of the reins, and this is the next fill-in in our bulletins this morning, because the truth is we need to see our speech as something to be harnessed. We need to see our speech as something to be harnessed. Sometimes I can fall into this place of assuming that my tongue is like its own thing with a mind of its own, and it just, like, there's no hope, right? It's just going to say whatever it says, and I'm going to deal with it afterward, and that's all there is to it. But the truth is that God wants to get involved in our lives, and he, he wants to speak to how I speak, and he wants to help me grow in how I use my voice. The way we speak is something that needs to be controlled. It needs to be submitted to God and guided by him. And it can be. And maybe for some of you this morning, this is the thing that God is trying to show you in the mirror and saying, this is what I want to work on with you. The final things James says is about the kind of religion that God does accept as pure and faultless. And this is the next point in our notes as well. Understand what religion means to God. Understand what religion means to God. Sometimes religion ends up being a dirty word to some people. Have you guys ever experienced that before? Maybe some of you are like, yeah, I don't like the word religion very much. Believe me, I get that. I understand that. I know that in the name of religion, under the umbrella of religion, sometimes people do really awful things to each other. I get that. I understand that, okay? And and I know that some of you have probably experienced moments of hurt that you would classify as religious hurt. But in my experience, however, it's not usually religions that hurt people, it's people that hurt people. Does the religion sometimes play a role in shaping the behavior of the people doing the hurting? Of course it does. Sometimes it can. That's exactly what James is trying to say here in this moment. That's exactly what he's trying to help us watch out for and be careful of that. But I get a little cautious when I hear people who want to stop using the word religion altogether because I don't think God is done with the word yet. 
I think he's still using it. The Greek word that we translate as religion here is a word that simply means worship as expressed in religious actions. Worship as expressed in religious actions. And I don't know about you, but I am not done expressing my worship through religious actions yet. That's why we're here this morning in church. This is a religious action, coming to a church, to sit in a church service, and to participate in singing songs of praise, to participate in praying together, to participate in fellowship, in getting together. With I'm not done with worshiping through religious actions yet, okay? I want to keep loving people. I want to keep giving to the Lord. I want to keep being engaged with the things that he is engaged with. That's his understanding of religion. Can we sometimes do unfortunate things under the umbrella of religion? Yes, and that's exactly what James is concerned about. He doesn't want us falling into that space where our religion is worthless. He wants us engaging in a version of worshipful life and worshipful action that is beneficial and constructive to the world around us, that is bringing the kingdom of God here to earth in the way that Jesus wanted to. When James uses this word, he is not encouraging us to be bad, spiritually abusive people. He is very intentionally trying to get us to be the opposite of that. He wants us engaging in religious life in ways that God himself will find praiseworthy. And if you think about it, his words here sound an awful lot like, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself, don't they? That was Jesus' way of summarizing religion, and James is saying something very similar here. Religion, I understand why this happens, but religion does not have to be a dirty word. And James is warning us that our religious lives can be worthless if we aren't engaging in them appropriately, and that's part of why he's writing the letter. He wants us to be aware of that. He wants us to be looking in the mirror and seeing what God is doing. He wants us to be healthy participants in the process of spiritual growth and development. So as we finish today, there are two questions that I want to end with that I want to encourage people toward. And the first one is this. What are you seeing in the mirror? What are you seeing in the mirror? Who are you? What is your own sense of your identity? Are you busy making your own sense of self or have you been hearing God speak to you about who you are? Are you running around the jungle Hakuna matata your way through life? That's That's another Lion King reference, by the way, for anybody who didn't get that, okay? Or is God calling you towards something greater, something that he has designed you for? Part of the beauty of a regular devotional life of prayer and scripture reading, of fasting and time in the word is that it gives God a chance to speak to us about exactly these things. And the other part of the mirror analogy is seeing areas in ourselves that need addressing. It is okay to look in the mirror and think, wow, I have really got to do something about that part of my life. That's all right to see that and think that. It's the next step that is critically important because I can either walk away and say, I have to fix this in me, or I can go to God and I can say, God, I need your help with this. And then and here, and this is what James is critically concerned about. Once I have gone to God, I need to keep on going back to him over and over. I need to stay engaged and I need to say, God, how am I doing with my anger? How am I doing with this issue over here? How am I doing with how I talk to my friends or my family? How am I doing with... What are the areas for you? What is God showing you this morning? What does he want to work on? What are the next steps that he has for you? And the second question is this, what is God trying to grow in you right now? What is the seed that he is trying to grow in you in the garden of your soul? Don't finish today without talking to God, without looking in the mirror and letting him identify something that he's trying to grow in you. He is at work somewhere. God is never not doing something. He is always at work in you, and he wants you to know what it is. He doesn't want you to be ignorant of it. And he may be responsible for that growth, but he wants to get you involved in the process of gardening. He wants to get you, us, all in the proce- involved in the process. Um, after I pray at the end of the service, we're going to have the pastoral partners come up. They're going to be here and available. If there's anything that you want prayer for this morning, maybe it's something that God is speaking to you about, something you've seen in the mirror that you want his help changing, come forward and tell somebody and ask for prayer in that area. If it's something else, if you have a prayer need for healing or for something else going on in your life, come forward for that too and let them know. But let's go ahead and finish the service by praying together. God, I thank you for today. I thank you for this morning, for the opportunity to be here, to hear from you, to receive from you, for the opportunity to be your kids, your family, 
Father, speak to us. Help us to see ourselves clearly. Help us to see ourselves as people who were created by you as an expression of your hands, but also help us to see ourselves clearly as you are growing us into the, into the image of your son, into greater and greater Christ-likeness, and engage us in that process, God. Help us to see ourselves clearly in both ways and help us to stay connected to you. Help us to hear the words of value and of love that you want to speak to us and help us to hear the words of direction and of leading that you want to guide us in. Make us your children. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Church, thank you for being here this morning. Again, if you've got prayer needs of any kind, the pastoral partners will be down here. Other than that, have a wonderful Sunday. We will see you guys all very soon.